see on this graphic I, uh, that most of the eastern half of the nation, uh, not under a drought at all. In parts of the southeast were in a pretty severe drought just a couple of uh, three years ago, especially in the southeast. But uh, most of it's out in the uh, around the Four Corners area, and then especially in the, more of the agricultural producing areas from the uh, central and southern high plains. But again, these rates in recent days have held. Uh, this will be updated, uh, this is updated every couple of weeks, but this is from August 6th. And you can see the, uh, we've really gone down in the amount of Texas, it's in the uh, E4, which is the worst category of drought, the uh, exceptional drought. Uh, just, uh, just three months ago, we had about 12% of the state in that. Now we're down currently about 6% of the state is in that D4 drought. Uh, and you can see the largest contiguous area there is right from Lubbock over in this direction, especially up toward Plainview, and that area is just a little bit south of Lubbock. So there's no there's no area that has a larger contiguous drought than right here uh, in this area. Uh, although I think uh, Floyd County is doing a little bit better. And I'll zoom in there and you can see that uh, from here's Lubbock County right there, going a little bit north and east and then south down toward Tahoka. Uh, but it is spotty, and it's probably a little spottier than this map. This is a smooth map, obviously, and sometimes the, uh, the drought conditions with the spotty convective rains we've had uh, can vary quite a bit just you know, over a few miles, as, as you know. But things are looking better. You know, we're, we're about uh, two and a half, approaching three years into the drought, uh, and if we can keep this uh, going just a little bit longer, uh, things are looking a lot better. So here's the U.S. seasonal drought forecast. Uh, we do show persistent drought uh, in this area, back in Oklahoma, and across most of the Lone Star State. We do show improvement happening back to our west. Now, this is more uh, related to the southwest monsoon, uh, but I would think the way the way we've uh, been seeing the weather over the past few weeks, uh, we could probably extend this improvement out uh, a little farther uh, to the east, maybe at least to the edge of the Cap Rock. But again, you know, it is uh, fairly spotty. But, you know, persistent drought over a big chunk of the nation will probably continue through the cool season. Now, this is, a, this is a precipitation map, not from last night. I didn't have time to put that together, but this is from, uh, you know, 48 hours ago. And we can see we, we've been in this northwest flow where we get these storms that roll down from the Mexico and the Texas Panhandle. And here's Lubbock right here. And we can see on the, uh, this is radar estimated rainfall by suggestion. So uh, this ought to be pretty close. It is kind of a rough, uh, a rough map in terms of the pixels here, not real high resolution. But, you know, Lubbock had uh, around two inches, one and a half to two inches, especially just south of Lubbock. And right here in northern uh, Floyd County, you see some three inch amounts there. So again, you can almost see those storm tracks as they come down, rolling in from the northwest. And then uh, down in the rolling plains from Guthrie southward, big, big areas of one and a half, two inches. So uh, conditions are definitely getting, getting better there. This is the current year-to-date uh, precipitation. Since it doesn't vary much across the area, all uh, sort of looks the same color. Just to give you an idea, this would be uh, from January 1st. Uh, in the greens here, you can't see the different shades of green, but there are some pockets of the darker green. But most of the green is at least uh, 10 inches of rainfall. Uh, and the darker greens gets up around 15. These blue areas, which do come through Lubbock and out into Floyd County, parts of Hale County, and up around Dennett, Friona, that would be somewhere in the 5 to 10 inch range. So that would, that's definitely a, a, a moisture deficit, uh, uh, well below normal. And here is a percent of normal precipitation map for the year, again, for January 1st. Uh, the sort of gray areas are pretty close to normal, plus or minus two inches. But we look in the, uh, the yellow there, and we're looking at at least uh, you know three or four inch deficit. Again, this is not including last night's rain. Uh, and then the darker up here, which is a uh, part of Floyd County, we're looking at maybe a, a six inch deficit. So not too bad. Again, you, you have to take this in a relative sense. Compared to the previous two years, this is not bad at all. You almost become a little bit accustomed to below normal uh, rainfall. So when we get up to normal, uh, definitely good news. We do have some areas out here in the western South Plains. This would be uh, this is Bailey County around Muleshoe, and then some pockets extending down 
a little bit farther south, which have rainfall at least two to four inches above normal. So we've really turned the drought, uh, we're starting to turn the drought around in a hurry, uh, you know, 30 to about you know, 75 miles west of Lubbock, all the way to, to the Mexico border, where they've had uh, the monsoon really kicked in pretty early there, and they've had persistent rains. Uh, in some cases, in really big rains. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on lake levels. I meant to do a longer period, but uh, just to emphasize the point that uh, these reservoirs, which uh, supply city water to a lot of folks, uh, continue to go down. Uh, it seems like for a, for a lot of reasons, I'm not going to go into all of those, but uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to sustain lake levels out here this far west. It seems to be easier about 100 degrees, which is you know where the western Oklahoma border is from there eastward. Uh, the lake level seems to stay pretty persistent or have. Uh, but this is why uh, Lake Allen Henry and then White River Lake. This is only a few days, but uh, I didn't know White River Lake could go down any more than it already has. But <laughs> it's just about uh, to almost get close to zero capacity. Here's an accumulated precipitation map for Lubbock officially. And the line on here at the top is normal rainfall for Lubbock is about 18, close to 19 inches. Uh, this was the driest year ever in red. That was in 2011. We blew away the records in 2011. Uh, had about eight, between most areas around Lubbock had between eight and nine inches. Uh, I'm sorry, between five and six inches. And, and all the driest years before that were between eight and nine. So the rec we, we blew away the records in a way that maybe we wouldn't have ever expected. Uh, but here's where we were now. And this is not including last night's rain. Uh, officially, Lubbock was around uh, eight to nine inches. Uh, and I don't think it's going to flatline here either. The way it looks, a uh, good chance of rain again tonight. Maybe a slightly less chance of rain tomorrow night. Then we get into a little bit drier pattern, I think, over the next week or so. Uh, but, you know, here we've, got, we've still got a ways to go to get up to normal. And again, we're working from a, about a three year deficit of rainfall, a big one. This is a little closer to home in Floyd Data, the Cooperative Observer Station. And again, rainfall in Floyd Data is a little bit higher. Uh, it's above 20 inches on the average. And here we were, again, about 8 to 9 inches uh, toward mid-August. So really uh, starting to improve since about mid to late June, but uh, we're still hoping we get in September and October some rainfall. Now, one of the, you know, a lot of folks ask me all the time, what's the weather going to be like a month or three months down the line? We don't have a lot of good predictors for that. We, we look at certain things out like if you're familiar with something called the Madden Julian oscillation, it's a it's a disturbance in the tropics and subtropics that sort of rotates around the earth uh, with areas of rising air and, and clouds and, and thunderstorms near it and then sinking air uh, you know out ahead of it and behind it. Uh, that is one of those kind of predictors that we can look at about a week or two, but we're not good at predicting it beyond that. Uh, there's not really a lot to look at other than statistical and dynamical models which have limited success when you're looking at a one month or three month forecast. One of the things that's the exception to that rule is the La Nina, what's called the ENSO, the El Nino La Nina Southern Oscillation. Uh, and if you follow this any at all, I'm sure a lot of you do, we, we were in the La Nina, that a few months ago went away. We're kind of in a neutral pattern now, but remember the La Nina keeps, uh, this is kind of a winter time, uh, jet stream pattern that keeps our part of the country very, uh, usually warm and dry. Uh, the good news is that's weakened and it looks like we're going to go uh, not to a full-fledged El Nino, but temperatures in the, again, we're looking at temperatures out here in the, in the tropical equatorial Pacific. There's a region we look at that seems to correlate well with, uh, with this pattern. Uh, and even though we may not go to a full-fledged El Nino, the temperatures in that part of the Pacific, which have been cooler than normal for a couple of years on and off, uh, they may go up above average, maybe just a, about a half degree. That wouldn't put us in El Nino, but it would move us closer to that. Our wintertime prediction on this is best in about a month. That's when our predictability is higher and we can look out through the winter. This El Nino La Nina doesn't have much uh, correlation in our part of the country in the summer, in the warm season. It's more of a cool season phenomenon. Uh, you know, we can make guesses about it, but it just doesn't correlate much well with uh, rainfall, for example, this time of year. Uh, so, but the fact that it's moving in a positive direction and the waters are warming out here is, 
know, that could lead us to an El Nino in the next uh, few months or perhaps in the next uh, a year or so. So certainly a positive, uh, some positive news. And, and these are some various models. You know, again, if you, if you sustain a three-month average below this minus 0.5, that's Celsius out in that area, if you can stay down below that line, you're in a, uh, you're in a La Nina. If you get up a, a half a degree Celsius more, warmer than normal out in that area above the a line about right here, then you would call that an El Nino. Well, the models, we're still down a little bit below zero, but we're, you know, if you take the average of those uh, multitude of models, it does bring it above zero uh, in the next few months. Not, not up to the El Nino level, but, but it's certainly moving in that direction. So uh, another, uh, what's called the climate forecast system model, you know, again, we're, we're located right here, and the, the average of the spread here is, is above normal. And, you know, even if we were to get in a weak El Nino, that doesn't have a, really a lot of correlation. We don't have a lot of episodes. That's a problem with this. Uh, there's only about a dozen episodes over the last uh, 50 years or so. But with the data we have to look at, uh, if we get into a weak El Nino, still not a lot of correlation. If we can get it up to moderate and strong, we usually have well above average rainfall for the winter. So this will be something to watch in the next few months to see if that trend upward continues. If it does, I would go out on a limb in a couple of months and say there's a very high probability. Uh, you know, it's got to get a lot warmer than the models are showing, but uh, very high above average rainfall or even snowfall for the winter months. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what happens on that. Uh, the, the probability through the winter, the highest probability is that it will stay neutral with much lower probabilities of either going into the El Nino or going back into La Nina. Uh, but you know, much higher probabilities in the green, which is neutral. I want to talk a little bit about fire weather. Uh, you know, I, I know we've got areas where grasses are starting to, to come up a little bit, the fuels. Probably not near the levels we had in 2010, but we as meteorologists, you know, when we talk about the probability for grass fires, uh, we look at the fuel load. And I know but because of the two and a half year drought, because of grazing and, and fires that we've had in some areas, uh, the grass and the fuel loads are down, but with these rains, they're going to come up a little bit uh, before we enter the dormant season. So, uh, you know, what, what's fire weather going to be like next spring? Well, balancing those things, it may be, uh, my guess is it'd be about average. I don't think, uh, I don't think we've had enough rain to recover from two and a half years to get back into tall grasses. Uh, and, then we did, and then on top of that, we have to have a very dry spring, winter and spring, to put everything in place to have a real active fire weather season. Uh, so anyway, outdoor burn bans. Uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer. Uh, here's Lubbock County, right here's Floyd County. It's kind of a checkerboard look, uh, and, and we're seeing fewer counties that still have those established burn bans. So that kind of shows you, you know, some of that is just the policy of the local county and some of it kind of the spottiness of the rainfall. And some counties, you know, tend to err on the side of caution of that as well. And this is as of August 14th, so it's pretty current. But you can see down in part of the hill country and a big part of central and into east Texas uh, still burn beds. One hurricane can change that in a hurry, though, down in that part of the state, sir. Uh, the Keats Byron Drought Index, uh, this, this is kind of a, uh, uh, a balance of the soil moisture. And really, we look at this for fire weather. When we get up into the 500 to 600, these warm colors, that's when we expect, uh, especially in fire weather season, a higher risk of uh, fires. But you can see we've got a lot of blue going on the map, or, or greens, which is the that keeps fire drought index down in the 200 to 300 range. Still, some areas are in 500 or 600. Uh, in the, in the peak of the fire weather season, that would mean a fairly high fire risk. But we're in the middle of a, some rain in the, the, the growing season where a lot of the fuels are, are not dor dormancy, obviously, they're green. So uh, we don't have to worry about that much right now. And I'll skip past some of these. So uh, I've got a few more maps. The drought conditions are improving. Again, drought's kind of a slow thing. It's sort of like El Nino, La Nina. By the time you're out of it, uh, you've probably been out of it a while before those in, those slow moving indices come up and reflect that. So I know some of you around here, it's hard to imagine in a, in a short to medium term crop need with the water I saw coming in from, from Rawls that you know, you're, you're in, a, in a, a 
dire situation in terms of drought. But of course, we're, we're replenishing a lot of lost soil moisture. Uh, so you know, that's something we have to, we, we really need to hope the rains keep coming. Uh, may have a wetter spring uh, this year, I think just statistically to stay in the low levels of precipitation, just from a probability standpoint, is pretty low uh, to keep those rainfall you know, way, way below 18 inches, which is the average of low for 20 inches out here. So uh, the fuel load is a little bit lower, but that may come up right here at the end of the growing season. And again, what we look for when we get this combination of extreme fire behavior, uh, I would be surprised to see that next spring, but a lot can happen in six months if, if the rains were to just completely shut off. So, uh, you know, we always have a, we always have a, 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 a moderate risk out here of grass fires especially from about February, January uh, in through March into early April. Now let's look at the outlooks again. Uh, I want to go ahead on this real quick and show you what, what, where we get these. You see these outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, how, these have limited use, but you know, there's something to look at. The best we can do sometimes. These are based on dynamical statistical models. The ENSO, which is that La Nina, El Nino, if that's a factor. Find the normal soil moisture, which is very important, and then using a linear regression math technique to put this all together. The predictive accuracy of this is best in the late winter and late summer, and the lowest in the late spring and late fall. So we're getting into the time of year, uh, maybe in another, uh, well, technically we're in late summer now, so in August. So predictability of these should be a little bit higher. So let me go back real quick and the one month outlook. Again, this would be statistics, but also be the best we can tell what would be the average position of the jet stream, et cetera. Uh, we see above normal temperatures. Uh, this would take us through August and early September uh, down into our area. Again, this is just a slightly better than above normal compared to the other two categories. Uh, and then below normal up toward the Great Lakes. As far as precipitation, the next month, uh, equal chances, which means there's no strong signal for necessarily above normal. We do see it back to our west toward El Paso up into New Mexico, and that would be a reflection of that very active southwest monsoon continuing. But you know, just to see these uh, this wide on the map, these equal chances is great because all we've seen most of the time in the last couple of years is below normal, below normal, and a lot of those forecasts have been right. So that's over the next month. If we look out a little bit longer, uh, this would be September, October, November. Uh, Again, the uh, above normal temperatures again over our part of the world with a stronger signal out to the southwest. Uh, and that would be indication of perhaps a, you know, an upper level ridge, which we've seen persistent. Uh, persisting out of this area, but if that were to happen, we might get a northwest flow and keep these storms coming down you know, from the central plains like we've seen in the past few days. Uh, and then rainfall three months out through November getting into the, the through the fall, uh, equal chances. So again, no strong signal uh, for rainfall we can see. Now let's talk real quickly as I finish up here about the hurricane season. So what difference does this make for us? Well, it actually does. Uh, in my 20 years in Lubbock office, I have rarely seen an Atlantic, uh, some of you may remember it, but I've rarely seen an Atlantic a Gulf hurricane bring rain up here on the Cap Rock. Sometimes we forecast it, sometimes we have flash flood watches out. But for a, for a hurricane to bring a lot of rain, and this would be especially in, into September, into mid-October, to bring a lot of rain up here, usually they tend to start curving up, up toward Oklahoma and then, and then curve northeast. You also need a front or something to trigger that rain. If you just get a big bunch of, uh, a lot of tropical moisture in the air that can hang around for several days, but there's nothing to focus that rain and generate those showers, it might just stay real humid for a few days and then the moisture moves out and you wasted all the moisture. And that's what happens a lot. Uh, so the exception to that, and, and this is based on my memory, which sometimes is not that good, was Hurricane Alex. Remember right before the drought started, we had the remnants of Hurricane Alex that came up and brought, I think it was five to eight inches of rain in Lubbock and then 10 to 15 down in Lynn County toward the Boca. We had a lot of flooding from that. That was actually almost the, uh, I think that was July 4th and 5th of 2010. Then we had another uh, uh, rain in late October, and that was it. The rains completely stopped in late 2010 after that. Uh, but for what it's worth, if we could get a Atlantic hurricane, now with that said, I have seen more systems that 
come up through Central Texas and rain off the Cap Rock in the Rolling Plains. It's a little more common with the trajectories of those uh, Atlantic tropical storms. Uh, but the, the season, this is based on the new forecast just a few days ago, is a 70% chance of above normal uh, hurricane activity. So I think we're going to see a, a quite a few tropical storms, several names, uh, several hurricanes, and even a few uh, major hurricanes, with one or two probably impacting the U.S. Uh, at least that's what the statistics look like. The forecast was lowered very, very slightly, but uh, based on the, the uh, ENSO neutral and based on a lot of things down in the Pacific, uh, one, one of which is the, uh, the warm waters out in the uh, development region all the way to the coast of Africa. It looks like it may be very active hurricane season starting just any day now through the uh, end of October, probably through October. So that's something to watch for if we could get a, a storm up here. The problem with that is sometimes the rains come way too fast, way too much. And you go from drought to flood pretty quick. Uh, and I, we might not see this. Our more common way to get tropical rains is from Pacific, from Pacific storms. Uh, most of those just go out in the, out harmlessly in the Pacific. Some of those curve up. There's not many that do. They curve up across Arizona and come, come into West Texas. Now those are a little more common to bring rainfall in in the uh, August, September, maybe in the early October time frame. Uh, the forecast for the Pacific is a little below normal uh, for activity out there. But even given that, uh, it's, it's a little more common to see that moisture and the remnants of some systems come up this way. So, uh, you know, that's always the, the hope we have out here is we get some benefit from the tropics. Uh, it doesn't happen every year, but if you look at uh, Lubbock's, here's the average rainfall. Uh, this is July, this is August. And as most of you know, they're in agriculture. Uh, through October, you've got a good chance of rain, but it drops off to less than an inch on average in November, and then it's pretty dry all the way through March. So if you're going to come out of a drought, you better do it through October. Keep getting rains like we've been getting, because you're not going to see that, probably. Uh, you know, even big snows, when you melt down that, you subtract off the sublimation of the snow, uh, you just you don't get a lot of moisture content compared Nothing like these rains we've been having lately. So, uh, but and what I want to point out here too is we have a secondary peak of precipitation. We have a big one in May and June, but we have another secondary peak in Lubbock in, in September. Now that is from tropical systems. There's been a few over the years that have really produced a whole lot of rain, like Alex did. Uh, Alex was in July, but uh, you get that sometimes, and that sort of skews the numbers up. You don't get it most years, but when you do. Uh, it's pretty heavy. So, uh, so statistically, anyway, you know, we we, uh, we don't get a lot in those November through March months. And if we if we're in a La Nina or if we continue in a persistent drought, you're just going to have to wait probably until April to pick back up and start making dents in that again. So, I hope I did okay on time. So, does anybody have any questions on anything? Uh, Well, there, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, uh, I'd have to see which. Oh, the, I'm sorry. The, the question is, how come sometimes you look at? The storm estimated rainfall, storm total pre precipitation from the Amarillo radar compared to the Lubbock radar, uh, and why do they show more? Well, that could be, first of all, that could be a little bit of a tuning on the radar for one. Radars can run a little hotter in terms of reflectivity, so it's estimating more. Uh, we are estimating now, and uh, I'm not sure, uh, all, all of this doesn't get into the precipitation estimates, but. We, we're looking at rainfall estimates now with our dual pole radar, which does a lot better job. It, it, it determines the shape of the, and, and the, the orientation of the raindrop or snow or whatever. And it seems to do a lot better in terms of those bias adjustments uh, with the radar. But that should be equal from radar to radar. So I'll have to look into that. Uh, you know, uh, some of that is going to be distance from the radar. If you're looking at Floyd County, for example, 
you're a long ways and you're shooting up a lot taller in that storm uh, than you are, say, from uh, from Amarillo than you would be from Lubbock. So there are some radar sampling issues there. You, you know, two radars, unless you're equidistant away, uh, you're not going to be looking in the same part of that storm. And if it's a low top storm, you know, say it's a 20,000 foot tall thunderstorm that's not real tall but has a lot of moisture down the low level, that, those things will affect it. But uh, I think part of that could be explained by the, you know, we've noticed for a few years, and I don't, I'm not sure if it's still the case, that the Clovis radar, Cannon Air Force Base, out north, uh, well, it's really northwest of Clovis, uh, their reflectivities run a little hotter. And if that's the case, obviously it's going to make the rainfall uh, different. So there, there's a couple of reasons for that. But actually, the way our radars uh, do out here, you know, if it's a three inch rainfall and two radars are only off about a half an inch to an inch, that's actually not that bad, believe it or not. Uh, because of storms are a little higher based here, now lately they haven't been, uh, it, it's tough sometimes for radars to estimate rainfall. But when you see those estimates, if you're looking at something that's bias adjusted, it should be correcting that based on gauge, gauge uh, reports, you know, and adjusting it in, in, in based on a lot of gauges in that area. So it should be pretty good, I think, with dual pole radar. If the estimates you're looking at are based on dual pole estimates, they should be a lot better than the traditional because they, they take in a lot more uh, a lot more. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you.